One thing you guys should know before I start is I've always been the kind of guy that when I see a problem, I just don't want to solve the problem here and for this one specific situation. I always want to try and solve the problem for almost any situation. And that's led me down a pretty interesting path in my career where I've been lucky enough to work with you know, entrepreneurs, startup companies, as well as very large global Fortune 500 companies to, to figure out things, to figure out new strategies, new markets, new products. And along the way, I've got to develop a lot of intellectual capital, a lot of patents that I did become one of the 300 IBM master inventors. But more importantly, it's led me to my current role as the worldwide business development leader in the IBM Watson Group, where I actually get to work with companies big and small to figure out what are those next generation products powered by cognitive computing. So with that, let me rewind the clock back 50 years. Right, if you think back to the days of science fiction in particular, we had very imaginative ideas about being able to talk with computers, you know, to have like a conversation with them, and not just have them help us analyze things, but actually be able to do things, you know, through androids or robots. Well, 50 years later, where we are today, we've gone from imagination to actually innovation, where all these things actually now exist. So I'm going to spare you all the cliches that the future is now and let's be a game changer and tell you what the real bottom line is. We have a unique opportunity today to actually transform how we live, how we do business, how we almost do everything in our lives, right? The iPhone, I'm sure most people hopefully are familiar with the iPhone. This is not even 10 years old yet. Did you know that? Think about how much this has impacted your lives, how you interact with people, how you watch movies, TVs, listen to music, how you uh, buy things, how you do business. We're on the same cusp of this type of transformation once again with cognitive computing. So let me say what exactly is cognitive computing? And that's basically building a computer that can mimic human thinking. And there's really three key things to that. And the first piece is really this idea of machine learning. You know, as human beings, as we do things, as we read more, as we talk with people, we learn, right? We keep building upon that knowledge. It's the same thing with cognitive computing. The more it does something, the more information you give it, the smarter it actually becomes, the more capable it becomes at things. The second piece is the ability to understand natural language. And I, I can't really underscore how difficult that truly is. Think about all the jargon, all the idiom, all the slang that we use. So much that we understand from talking to each other is through context. If I were to say something like, hey, that's cool, what's the computer going to think? You're going to be like, is Neil cold? Is he okay? Is he being sarcastic? That's the power of cognitive computing, that just by that statement, the context of our conversation, it's going to know, okay, based on context, based on Neil's tone of voice, he's being sarcastic, I get it. And then the third piece is the way to actually interact. That we no longer have to put in queries or keywords. We can have a conversation with a computer as if it were another person, right? If I were to go and type into a Google search engine, hey, show me all the restaurants near me except for pizza, what do you think I'm going to get? bunch of pizza places, right? If I go to a cognitive computer and say that, not only is it not gonna give me the pizza places, it might go, you know, I know Neil. I know Neil likes Japanese food, and I know he'll probably drive a little bit further for Japanese food, so let me prioritize this list I'm gonna give him, and maybe I'll consider things a little bit further away that are Japanese restaurants. That's really the power that cognitive computing brings to bear. And that's because as a result, it's developing a whole new way of thinking for us. No longer do we have to worry about remembering everything out there, of uh, thinking of thousands upon thousands of potential variables, factors, influencers, of relying just on ourselves on being able to connect all the dots together, especially in a high pressure, time sensitive type of situation. We actually have help now. We have help through cognitive computing. So let's look at the healthcare industry. It's got some of the most 
complex information challenges actually out there. So medical information doubles about every five years. So there's exponential growth. 81% of physicians report that they have five hours or less just to keep up on medical journals. They, they can't keep up on the latest innovations, pharmaceuticals, and all that kind of stuff. And as a result, now we're seeing that about one in five diagnoses are actually inaccurate or incomplete. We see about 1.5 million errors just the way medications are prescribed in the United States alone. And probably worse is that we see up to 100,000 people are actually at risk of death from medical errors that could have been prevented just in the hospital situation. So these are some big challenges we're facing. How can cognitive computing actually help us? Well, what if we had a tool we could give the doctors that's kind of their own you know, subject matter expert, their own personal physician's assistant, right? So we have a patient come in, they're showing various symptoms, maybe they're a little dizzy, they've lost their appetite, they're always feeling thirsty. You know, the, the doctor's doing their work and in the background we've got our little you know, PA helping out and it's taking a look at all the possible things based on those symptoms that this person might have and saying, well, based on these symptoms, these are the top five possibilities, right? And from what I know, I'm gonna start trying to figure out what the diagnosis might be. Well, I can take it even a step further and say, what about the things, the symptoms the person's not showing? Maybe I'd do some little process of elimination and make a better diagnosis that way. I'm also gonna factor in family history because that's gonna influence what the kind of disease this person might have. In the parallel, I'm gonna look at the person's own patient history, what kind of medical issues that they've had in the past, what was their exercise, diet routine might be like. Could take a look at medications because there might be some side effects in play here. And then lastly, I'm gonna take a look at any findings. So if there's been tests or something that's been done, take a look at that and come up with what I think is the most confident diagnosis of the problem. So I'm just trying to enable the physician to be able to give the best possible diagnosis possible by processing all this information, sharing it, and coming up back and saying, this is what I think as a cognitive computer it might be. Here's my confidence level, but more importantly, if you want to know why I think this, I can explain it to you. So that's really the important thing. We don't have to look at patients as giant pools of people anymore. In fact, we don't have to look at anything as giant pools of people. We can create a very individualized, personalized answer recommendation. Think, for example, how many guys have been ever out hanging out with maybe three friends and someone says, hey, does anyone want to grab a bite and eat? And then you're spinning around, well, where do you want to go? I, I really don't care, right? And you guys go kind of back around, back and forth, you finally pick a place. Well, you could use a cognitive computer to help you actually find the optimal place for all of you. That machine might look and say, okay, this person doesn't like to drive very far, this person doesn't like... Italian food, this person doesn't like to spend a whole lot of money and come up with a best fit restaurant for you guys. Well, tomorrow if you were three different friends, guess what, you're gonna get a different recommendation. And that's really what we can bring to bear now. Coming up with the best answer recommendation for you. So why do we really need cognitive computing? It's because we really are dealing with these new types of problems out there. Right? They're very more complex, they're, they're ambiguous. We can't even fully define them ourselves anymore. Right? How, do, how do you explain that to a computer if we can't even define it? Right? There's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of factors and other things going on that we're like, I don't know if this really impacts this or not. We're also dealing with a very dynamic, information-rich culture today. Right? There's a lot of real-time data being generated, a lot of conflicting data. Right? Each one of you sitting here right now, you're all generating data whether you realize it or not. You probably all have cell phones, you're probably all sharing geolocation information. Some of you might be on Facebook or Twitter, you might be shopping, I don't know. Right? You might be wearing a Fitbit. Right? These are all data sources and they're constantly changing. We don't have time to keep creating new algorithms for every specific scenario. We need a machine that's smart enough to figure out these things. And that's why we're now able to focus on what's the best answer given this situation, given these group of people, rather than what's the right answer. So when it comes to cognitive computing, the key thing is to remember is there's three key elements here to resemble human thinking. The first is discovery. So much like human beings, as we learn, we do things, we get new insights, 
That's what cognitive computers can actually do themselves, is they keep learning, they can actually drive new, new insights for us. Second is the decision-making capability. They're really here to help us make better decisions. The huge advantage a cognitive computer has, though, is they can do it bias-free. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in one second, but I don't want to under understate the importance of bias-free because we all have some sort of, sort of biases built within us, whether we realize it or not. And lastly, just really the level of engagement, right, where I don't need to worry about coming up with the right set of keywords or framing the right question or whatever it might be. I can actually now have a conversation with a cognitive computer, right? If I'm wondering what mountain bike is best for me, I don't have to do a Google search, sift through a bunch of websites, reviews, visit stores anymore. I can just go to the cognitive computer and say, hey, what's the best mountain bike for me? And it might come back and say, well, why do you want to go mountain biking? I want to get back in shape. Well, here are my three top, top options for you. Right, that's the level we can get to. Now, how many of you guys have actually heard of a little app called Chef Watson? Not that many, that's a little too bad. It's a partnership between IBM and Bon Appetit. And basically what it is is you can ask Watson, you know, I've got friends coming over, I want this, I'm looking for a recipe. And Watson will come back and give you the, the best fit type of recipe for you. The great thing though is it doesn't have, it's not necessarily a recipe that already exists. Watson's actually creating brand new recipes. So we actually asked Watson, hey, I want a recipe for a healthy barbecue sauce. And Watson's like, well, what do you mean by healthy? Okay, uh, low calorie, high fiber. Got it. Came back with a bizarre set of ingredients. Butternut squash, chairman, basically a bunch of stuff you normally don't find in barbecue sauce. And we're thinking, eh, maybe this is not working too well. But we made it, it did taste great, and it was healthy. Right? Watson may not understand taste, but it understands chemistry. And it understands the chemical combinations that put together taste that human beings will like. And here's where the bias-free element really comes to play. There are certain foods that we just naturally think we should never combine together. It's probably not going to taste great. Watson doesn't have that problem. And as a result, it's unleashed a whole new set of recipes, a whole new set of flavor combinations that human beings have never thought of before. If you don't believe me, go out and try a chocolate Austrian burrito or a Vietnamese apple kebab, and you might be surprised. So out there today, there's already over 200 companies using cognitive computing in their products. And it spans the gambit of industries. There's not one area that's really untouched anymore. Financial services, education, healthcare, sports, athletics, Digital marketing, talent management, these are all areas, these are all examples of companies that are just out there leveraging the power of cognitive computing. So how do you really use it yourselves? You might be wondering. What I found working with people is, don't think of cognitive computing as, I've got this technology stack, and how do I replace it with cognitive computing? Instead, think about that one pain point that you've never been able to solve. Think about that opportunity, that one thing you've always wanted to do, but have never been able to do. Can cognitive computing actually help you do that? Right? For me, I've given away tons of ideas, even beyond my normal job. You know, I've given ideas away around fantasy sports. Right? Some people just get in their heads against certain teams or in certain locations and factor that in. You know, I've given away ideas around matchmaking, thinking about a, date, a dating app where you don't have to worry about someone putting on any pretenses or filling out a questionnaire a certain way. You could pull their real personality just from their Instagram photos, Facebook posts and tweets and find a real match for you, right? My personal dream is I'm hoping that one day somebody comes up with like a brainstorming app to help me actually do my job better. So you might be thinking this sounds good, there's probably something big here, but how do I really take advantage of this? It sounds pretty tough. Well. There's really three keys to success. First is you gotta find the value, right? If you think about our physician's app for a second, it's more than just building this nice little tool for a physician. The real value proposition is we're helping to reduce the number of lives lost to preventable medical errors. It's a huge value prop. Second is you gotta prepare the foundation. Obviously there's work involved. You gotta have the right people. You're going to have funding, you're going to have to have some access to data, and you have to have people that can teach the basics of how to do some of these things to the cognitive computer so it can learn and start learning on its own. 
And then third, and probably the most important one is, you gotta manage the change. Look, as people, we're naturally resistant to change, and that's always an issue, but think about how are you gonna make this a reality, right? If you create this physician's assistant app, What's a patient going to think? What's their trust level going to be in some machine helping to make a diagnosis? Or the physician wondering, like, is this machine going to replace me one day? Those are the real problems we need to tackle when we come up with these next generations of products and services. So my challenge to you guys is there's a great opportunity here. We have about to dawn onto a new age, age of cognitive computing. How would you use cognitive computing? Thank you.